broke down barriers and put a city's hip-hop hopes on his shoulders. He made Kansas City. And that's all we heard was tech, tech, tech. This is tech nine like the Jay-Z of Kansas City. I'll put it down, baby. With his city support, Tech 9 took his next level lyricism nationwide and astounded Raps Elite. The man is amazing. He had flows from, from day one. I had never heard anything like that before, the way he was so precise. It was very rapid, you know what I'm saying? And I rhyme fast too, but it was always, always. This dude was phenomenal. He was so different. This is the coldest shit I didn't ever heard. I flipped out, for real. You know, I almost fell out of my chair. He always had a talent, man, that was like beyond like everybody else's talent. It was dark, real dark, but it was club. So it was like, it was something new. But Tech 9 striking imagery and groundbreaking musical approach proved difficult to swallow for rap fans conditioned on bling. In the world of BET, he's looked upon as too rock and roll. So he was getting mixed reviews. Everybody's upset with Tech 9. Man, fuck Tech. A lot of frustration was, was building up at, at that point. Fuck Tech. Some of the people here feel like he's not as grounded as he used to be. Man, dude is straight doing white music. That ain't even hood shit no more, man. What what the fuck is wrong with Tech? But Tech Nine was taking rap to a new dimension. Tech Nine's head just works in ways that you would never imagine. My shit was always ahead of its time. I was always rapping different than everybody else. I always wanted to do something different. This is the story of Aaron Yates, better known as Tech Nine. His career's been riddled by false starts, broken promises, and more drama than an episode of ER. Welcome to the Tech 9 experience. Welcome to my city, Kansas City, Missouri. Tech 9 experience, this is where it all started. Come with me, dog. This is Wayne Minor Projects, man. Wayne Minor Projects. Everybody knows Wayne Minor if you know Kansas City. It ain't the lowest. <laughs> I think uh, Granat might be the lowest. This is right down the street, you know what I'm saying? I lived here from birth till like 10 years old. My grandmother lived here in this house. My mom lived here in this house. I lived here. My Aunt Susie, my Aunt Ivy, my Uncle Ricky, my Uncle Ikey. You know what I'm saying? We all lived in this house, man. And occasionally, my cousin Crystal and my uh, her mother Zita and little Curtis, everybody, man. We all lived in this little bitty ass house, man. I grew up in a really religious household. I was going to church like every day of the week. So you can probably find that religious, a lot of the religiousness in my lyrics. I used to hear church music every morning. Shirley Caesar every morning, all kind of mighty clouds of joy every morning. I got the religiousness from my mom and my grandmother and my aunt Susie. I got the rhythm from my uncle Ricky. I used to always beat on the table, boom, boom, bop, bop. And I learned that from him. If you see me beat on shit, you know what I'm saying? You know, if you know me from the lunchroom in school, if you know me from the bathrooms in school and shit like that, you know that I was real good with my hands. But Tech 9s love for music blossomed outside of school. The Reese's lived here, you know what I'm saying? Ronald Reese and them, you know what I'm saying? That's why I actually heard rap dirty. Now my rap was dirty and my line was mean and now it's time for a blowfly sting. What a bro, loo, 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 loo. It was a relief to come next door and hear rap dirty as opposed to right now, right now, you will leave. Oh, oh, right now, all the time. With his love for music growing, Tech 9 was soon on the move. This is 3826. This is where we moved after 904 Michigan from the projects. We're moving on up, of course. You know, this is moving on up when you're coming from Wayne Minor. This was my grandma's house. We was in here like 13 deep. It's crazy. Way crazy. We used to play all kind of shit back here, dog. Hide and seek, hide and go get it. I loved hide and go get it. That was tight. What's that? Hide and go get it. It's when you got girls playing with you, hide and go seek, but if you find the girls, you can go get it. We used to play high and go get it a lot. And whenever I found them, I got it. <laughs> we used to have a metal chair, metal table right here. Some kind of fucking metal table. I don't know why it was right here. And um, you know, it was rusty because it used to rain and shit. 
and me and my cousin Lamont were boxing right here. Like we were right, we used to box right here. Boom, boom, ba, ba, ba. He was bigger than me, you know what I'm saying? So we boxing, the boxing glove. So he's beating me up, and I put my head on the table, try to get him to stop, and I looked up like that, and he hit me, boom, ding, and my fucking tooth, shit, for life. My cousin Lamont, thanks for the chip tooth, nigga. With his family surrounding him, Tech 9 found a musical messiah. This is when I first got Roger Trotman and zapped, and we were totally zapped out, and it's a beautiful thing. A lot of musical memories here, you know what I'm saying? We used to have the tape recorder downstairs and imitate it, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Tape ourselves, doing our own Roger Trotman sounds. As his appreciation for music grew, Tech 9 developed a phobia. Clowns were kind of like scary to me because this is when I lived here, this is when I first went to a Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey circus. I think I was like 10. And uh, what I found disturbing about clowns was you couldn't see who they really were. And it was something about the way they shook their hand with the white gloves. They shook their hand, they shook my hand real hard and smiling at you and shit, but you didn't know if the smile was real because it was painted on. It was weird, it was always weird to me. Who would have thought I would have became the clown? I became what I feared so much. Don't mean that I'm fake. <laughs> it just means that I'm sick. <laughs> We're on 58th and Forest, man. This is where I moved when my mom got married to Abul Hassan Rasul Khalifa. One of the main challenges having a Christian mom and a Muslim dad was one, being able to have Christmas up till I was 12 and she married him when I was 12 and then we had to cut it off from there. We didn't celebrate Christmas and things like that, not in the house, but we would go to her uh, family's house and they would uh, celebrate Christmas, and I would participate, you know. Um, that, that was confusion for him because he was used to uh, dealing in Christmas. That was hard for me, you know what I'm saying? That's hard for any kid, for real. To them, it was a problem. To me, it wasn't a problem because I never imposed uh, my uh, religious beliefs on his mom or him. The only confusion came where we didn't, I didn't allow pork in the house. Uh, they wanted to go to church, they could go to church. Christianity said if you go this way, they'll receive, you know, God in the heavens and this, that, and the other, and Islam was saying the same thing, and when I got into school, you know what I'm saying, Confucius was saying the same thing, Shintoism, Taoism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, everything saying the same thing, so it just twisted me all up. Confused by religion, Tech 9 found an outlet for his energy. I used to put linoleum down on the co concrete right here and break dance right here, hit my head right here. <laughs> spinning on my back and shit, bust my head on this bottom step right here. In addition to dancing, Tech 9 was also spending time at a local skating rink. I was at the skating rink one day, and I heard this shit that sounded spooky as a motherfucker, but it made me stop in the middle of the floor. That's the first pulse that made me stop, like, it was fucking uh, Africa by and in the Soul Sonic Forest, Planet Rock, took me by storm, homie. Took me by storm. That shit blew my mind, dude. That's when I said, I got to do some motherfucking music. I got to do something. Right next door was my boy Chris Lenore's where I used to smuggle my records because my stepfather wouldn't let me have or wouldn't let me spend my money on uh, rap records. At that time, I wasn't a big rap fan myself because I was old school, you know, Marvin Gaye, The Temptations. I would, I could hear the music and I'd be sitting down in the front room. I would hear music. I'm looking around like, where is this coming from? And then I would listen to the music and I would follow the music and I, it would always lead me to him. He was always, he had a, a, a little boom box. He would have it down low or either he would have uh, the earplug and then he would be sitting there and he would be going through his rapping. <laughs> You know, that type of stuff, that type, the beatbox stuff that they were doing. On a dare, Tech 9 graduated from breakdancing and beatboxing to writing rhymes. Lola Morris, she lived on the next block, you know what I'm saying? And she's the one that told me to stop beatboxing and write a rap. And I came here and I wrote my first rap. But Tech 9 was shy and gave his raps to his friends. I became comfortable with rap when I used to write shit for my homies and they couldn't say it right, so I started saying it on the spot and people were going crazy. I'm like, shit, yeah, I'm gonna start doing it. You know what I'm saying? That's, so that's how I came out of my shell. Tech 9 wanted to test his rap skills, so he went to Black Walt, an established rapper in the neighborhood. Tech said, uh, hey man, I wanna start rapping. And we laughed, you know, we like, yeah, right, man, you ain't no rapper. Tech stands there, he get the beat in his chest, 
Giving a chance to rhyme my profession. No brother's gonna be a good star. Don't even think about sleeping because I'm fucking up every. And he's beating his chest with this shit while he's doing a whole rap. I'm like, man. Nobody was really rapping that rap, like, you know? And they was like, whoa. This dude has created a whole nother style that I ain't never heard. My homies was amazed that I could come with lyrics like that, man, come with stuff that was, that was so educated like that, you know what I mean? And everybody wanted to put me in their groups. Blown away by Tech Nine's brazen delivery, Black Walt told Tech Nine he wanted to name him after a gun. Walt decided to flip through a gun magazine for inspiration. Then we turned on to the back of the page, the very last page, and they had a Tech Nine right there. I had a Tech Nine at the time. So I was like, damn, my Tech Nine be shooting fast as a motherfucker. Tech be rapping fast as a motherfucker. Let's call this nigga Tech Nine. And he was like, Tech Nine. He said, yeah, I like that shit right there. And the way we spelled Tech Nine wasn't like the gun, it's spelled T-E-C. The gun is T-E-K, the other gun, Tech 22. We spell it T-E-C-H, like technique. The well, number nine is the number of completion. Everything after nine is double and triple. You know, after nine, there's nothing else like it. It's the whole nine yards. It's complete is everything. Newly christened, Tech Nine was eager to show off his rhyme skills. And I started performing it for people. So from performing it in the hallways and in the bathrooms and shit, turned to me on stage at the talent shows and shit. Tech Nine was excited about his upstart rap career. His stepfather wasn't. Uh, we used to have arguments about that. His schoolwork, uh, um, him not doing his homework or not even bringing the homework home from school because all he would think about was being a rapper. One day he said, uh, what do you got that everybody else don't have? You want to be a rapper? You don't have nothing special. So that, that made me want to be like, fuck that. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to have to do something way different to make motherfuckers see me. I always told him, I said, I don't have a problem with you being a rapper, but you need to concentrate on the education. And he was trying to teach me a lot of stuff here, man, you know what I'm saying? Being stern with me, man, because he know my mom was hella soft on me, you know what I'm saying? But I didn't take it like that then. So a Muslim, a Christian, and a theist didn't really coincide, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, I don't give a fuck what none of y'all talking about. I'm going to do my thing, you know what I'm saying? So I had to leave that place. I left home when I was 17. From Forrest, I moved with my Aunt Zita. From my Aunt Zita, I moved with my Aunt Ivy. From my Aunt Ivy, I moved with my homeboy Slow Mo uh, up on 74th and Forrest. And throughout that time, you know, I had met Icy Rock through Tanya Johnston and Soleil, you know what I mean? So we started getting real deep into music throughout the years. Down on his luck, Tech Nine jumped at the opportunity to work full time with Icy Rock. I mean, Icy Rock. Started doing it like in the studio every day. I moved in with that nigga. 1902, man. That's where it all popped. Focused on his music, Tech Nine was a quick study. I learned how to actually put hooks in songs and not have um, long ass verses, long ass 48 bar verses. You know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't even know what bars was. I used to just write before I met Icy Rock and just write and write and write and never counted, never knew about counting or nothing. I learned this was school for me, you know what I'm saying? The Nut House. We spelled it double N, U, double T, H O W Z E. Double N, two N's, because it stood for New Narcotical and then U T T, Untamable Techniques, you know? The House of New Narcotical, Untamable Techniques. Narcotical meaning like it's addictive, you know what I'm saying? My boy Brian Dennis, rest his soul, he just died on Christmas and shit. Um, came up with the barcode shit in the 66 4699 He spelled Nuthouse out on the phone because we communicate through song, you know what I'm saying? It's the communication device. As Tech 9 sharpened his songwriting skills, he became more and more comfortable at Icy Rock's house. This house got me with a motherfucker that understood music and understood how to put together music. And um, him being a fuck everything type of nigga, just like all of his friends, it taught me to not give a fuck about what I'm talking about. We just gonna be totally fuck everybody. So that's where the whole Tech 9 attitude came from. Fuck you, I wear my hair how I want to, my clothes, they can be raggedy. Fuck you, bitch, and you still gonna love me and buy my shit. Tech 9 relished his surroundings and went from pupil to leader. It was Nuthouse for real, and I was Charles Manson. Icy Rock then used his connections with local R&B group Low Key to open the door with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis's prospective records. Then in 93, we got a deal for Tech 9 
do Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Tech Nine first told me he got his signing. Um, uh, I was happy for him. I was really happy for him. And uh, I wanted uh, Aaron to really do good. And I told him the first thing you need to do, Aaron, when you make your big money is get your mom a house. But Tech Nine would have to wait for the big money. Soon after signing, Perspective Records became concerned with the direction of Tech's music. Perspective Records a and Sean Tyler. It's kind of like Slipknot meets Marilyn Manson meets the Insane Clown Posse meets Ice Cube. But Tech Nine's music was only part of Perspective's problem. They were saying it was another Tech Nine. So another Tech Nine coming out of New York used to be with Down with Onyx or something. And, you know, he's coming out and Mike, I was like, I'm not changing my name for no motherfucker. The Perspective thing, of course, didn't work out because of uh, Tech Nine being so different, the music was different. Uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis didn't really know how to market that brand of hip hop. So they sent us back home. Me, Icy Rock, my brother Donald Mack, and female rapper Agony, you know, sent us back. The record deals gave him hope. It gave him more of a security until he realized that a deal is just a piece of paper. So we in Icy Rock, the Icy Rock pit doing music. We start doing music like I can get Grimm, you know, it was just mad music, you know, I can get Grimm and Terror Vision and Poison Mist. Scarred by the prospective records fallout, Tech and his crew were looking for another opportunity. Fortunately, Tech Nine's childhood friend Don Juan was working with independent Kansas City rap label, Midwest Side Records. Don Juan approached me, <clears throat> saw me in the streets, like, man, you still with uh Jimmy Damn Trulu? Like, nah, they just let us off. Perspective. So you think you might want to do solo shit or a compilation or something? I'm like, yeah, I love to. Nigga, I ain't doing nothing. I was broke. I was broke. Don Juan and his partner Diamond gave Tech some music. They gave me this beat, Mitch Bay. Dun, 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 dun. It was kind of some Bay Area shit in the pocket type of music. And I just did my flow on top of it. What up, Mitch? Is it everything thing for you to act just like a bitch? How does it feel to have a nigga that kill you for the house every week? The rhythms of Mitch Bade and the story it tells and the way it tells the story is what makes it one of my favorite songs. That was the first time I heard somebody with that style, that real, you know, fast, choppy style. It was hard, man. Mitch Bade, these are the actual cruising down the spec with five splits roll, passenger seat, Sunday the whole stroll. Went to the park with Major Lou, dipping up on bitches, but the jealous Mitch is ready to shoot. You know what I'm saying? Tight. You know, it was like, it's like schizophrenic, but at the same time, it's on that gangster beat. Everybody could relate to it. With Mitch Bade, Tech Nine had his first local hit. Mitch Bade blew up, you know what I'm saying? Diamond, I think, probably pressed up 2,000 to 5,000 copies. And back then, nobody wasn't selling over 300 copies, for real, in Kansas City. It just made it to where the city was just like, whoa, shit. We, find, we got something here that we can work with that can put us on the map. Everybody was like, damn, he's from KC. It had never been anybody that rapped from here that done anything that made it out of here. So, you know, it made a big impact on me. It made me want to, you know, feel like we could do it from here. With Mitch Bade bubbling in the streets of Kansas City, producer Don Juan takes a trip to Los Angeles. 96, came out here with the CD. And um, somehow he was in touch with a chick named Lamona Wheaton. She worked for Rap Pages or Rap Sheet or some shit like that. Met him at Acapulco's, he gave it to her. She happened to know QD3. She was like, you know, I know this rapper from uh, the Midwest who's got like a dope flavor and everything. I was like, cool, let me check it out. Mona gave QD3, son of music icon Quincy Jones, a copy of Tech Nine's Mitch Bade single. When I heard Tech stuff, like he was rapping backwards. You know what I mean? And we were like, what? He called back in three days. Like, you motherfuckers got to get out of here. I love that shit. So did Pops. I'm like, Quincy Jones likes Mitch Bay, that ghetto shit? Yeah, Quincy Jones said, your rhymes, your style reminds me of Bebop. Skip it, bop, 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 What up, Mitch? Is there everything there? You know, it was like, he loved it. So, 97, we moved out here. You know what I'm saying? With QD3. The impression that I got is he was had pretty much exhausted the musical resources he could in that part of the you know geography of the country. And so coming out here and working with Q was the move that he needed to make at the time. QD3 was impressed with Tech Nine's music, but he was blown away by Tech's theatrics. He showed me videos of his show and he would like have on like an overall and then he'd take that off and have like the American flag and 
painted face and he'd have like some kind of like ultraviolet light that have his face glowing with the word like pain or something on his forehead, you know what I mean? So when I saw that, I just thought that he was a unique, like a superstar. For the first time in his career, Tech 9 was embraced by a renowned producer. It felt real good to me that a musician of his caliber um, would love me. QD3, we were just hype on it, man. Anytime we got to be around QD3, anybody like that, we for sure just thought it was gonna pop. While Tech 9 and his crew were living at his house, QD3 got an inside look into Tech's mind. We were just making records and stuff, and he would sit and read like books on serial killers and shit like that. So I was like, okay, we're dealing with somebody who's definitely a little different than the average MC. Tech seemed to be a little bit more like in the middle, like slash hippie, hippie slash gangster, you know what I mean? which um, immediately what I thought of was like that he could cross over. With QD3 backing him, Tech 9 was soon offered several record deals. We was hearing about his name being mentioned with, you know, Warner Brothers and Quincy Jones and different people looking at him. Shit was big for KC, man. It was real big. Tech 9 and Midwest Side Records signed with Quest Records, the label owned by Quincy Jones. Tech then started working on an album, Be Warned. My mindset at the time of Be Warned, I was just doing songs at the time. I really didn't have any direction. But Tech 9 had a breakthrough during a trip back to Kansas City when he met his idol, Roger Troutman, at a concert. Roger Troutman is, he's a big, he had a big hand in hip hop. I'd say that just like James Brown, you know, like a lot of people use funky drummer. You know, James Brown had a big hand in rap and so did Roger Troutman. It was that loud ass clap. It was skate music. I'm going, going back, back to Cali, Cali. Big, notorious big B.I.G., you know what I'm saying? California knows how to party. That's how you know, if you don't know Roger Troutman, that's how you know him from uh, California Love. Now in front of his idol, Tech 9s wildest dreams were about to be fulfilled. He said, what do you want to do, nigga? You want to make a hit or what? I was like, yeah, I want to. You know, so he's talking to me like he's my daddy and shit. So uh, I said, Don Juan, ask, Ro ask Roger how much. And he was like, you ask him, you ask him. I said, this nigga gonna say like $250, gonna take half of my budget, you know what I'm saying? So um, I say, Roger, so how much would it be to do this? He said, oh, I number 25,000. I was like, I want to laugh at his say like, twink, twink, nigga, I got that, you know what I'm saying? Elated by his good fortune, Tech 9 couldn't wait to record with Roger Troutman. It's right here in this house, blue house right here, upstairs. <clears throat> we did the Roger Troutman song, Twisted. Me and Don Juan we'd go up them stairs, go in the house, and Roger said he'd rather do it here than at a studio. And we did it right there. He did all the recording in there. So session woman you know i'm over here busy you always talk about money we ain't got no damn money what's the matter with you <laughs> hey hello she won't hear none of that shit hello with the roger troutman song completed tech nine finished recording be warned quest records was not impressed it was too crazy for the label, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's witch shit, it's warlock shit, it's devil worship shit. I'm like, no, nah, I wasn't. They kept saying, you know, it sounds too Kansas City, and, you know, and Tex Camp didn't want to cater to them at all. Quest wasn't feeling the crazy shit I was doing, the Tech 9 shit I really wanted to do, you know what I mean? They was feeling the more poppy shit, like, he's strange and I like it. You can have a deal, but be more unhappy than not having a deal, you know what I mean, if you're stuck there and they're not really doing anything for you. And unfortunately, that's kind of what ended up happening.
Quest Records decided to shelf be warned. Tech Nine was devastated. Uh, I was in a lot of pain. There was not a lot of, not, a, not a lot of money being made at that time. Tech really went through it. Like there were times where I was just like, man, I don't know how he's gonna make it through. Money wasn't right, you know what I mean? I had kids, so child support shit, you know, I just wanted to be to be taken away. Dejected, Tech Nine left Los Angeles and returned to Kansas City. But Tech's career took another bad turn. He was signed to Midwest Side Records, Quest Records, QD3, and had also committed himself to Sway and King Tech. The party started disagreeing about Tech Nine's direction. Tech was like the kind of person who would tell everybody yes. Tech Nine's made mistakes. And a lot of the mistakes that have been made were because of his heart. He got a heart that's big because that's why he got a lot of problems with different labels that he was with, with Midwest Side and everybody like that. I was going through all kind of shit with Diamond and Don Juan, you know what I mean? Breaking up with them, you know what I'm saying? Having misunderstandings with Sway. And I had text boys calling me like every day, tripping, you know what I'm saying? Showing absolutely no respect. Tech was like, man, fuck this, I'm not making no money. Um, fucking, he's got $1,800 of rent, you know, fucking bills out the ass. So he's, he's, you know, like, man, we need to make a move. Around the same time, my group, 57th Street RDVs, Scooby did Hog Style Records, and we did a group, boom, let's get fucked up. Don't, 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 let's get high, let's get drunk, don't, 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 don't. Man, I must have played that motherfucking song every day for like a whole year. Even Tech Nine's stepfather was a fan of the radio version of the song, Let's Get Crunked Up. Let's get crumped up. <laughs> That's one of my favorite ones when, when I go out and, I, and they play it. Uh, the whole house explodes. It was one of the biggest songs. Boom. Even blew up in St. Louis. Boom. Something Tech Nine never did. You know what I'm saying? And um, Tech Nine was steadily growing. But Tech Nine was still struggling financially. He had a friend who knew Travis O'Gwen, a Kansas City entrepreneur looking to get into the music business. Although a fan of Tech Nine's music, Travis had some questions about Tech's career. When I started looking at all the different business deals that he'd done and all the different things that he was doing in Kansas City or the things that he was doing from QD3 and Quest, I realized it's gonna take money and it's gonna take some attorneys and it's gonna take a lot of hard work to, to get this maybe on the right track. That's when me and him uh, actually when decided that uh, we were going to do a venture called Strange Music. I came to Diamond at Frederick Square. I said, uh, it's this white cat man who wanna give me my own label, man. You know, do this strange music thing. I gotta do it. Diamond said, man, I ain't never been the nigga that wanna step in your way, man. You do your thing. Then I took and met with QD3. Reserved, standoffish. Hold on, another person coming in. But he's seen it. He felt that, he, he knew that what I was trying to do was the right thing. So he started working with me. Even though QD3 was on his side, Travis soon ran into a number of problems. A lot of the other guys, like Diamond, who fell out with Q, who, Don Juan, who totally, totally fell out with QD3, and, you know, Sway, who fell out with QD3, uh, all of a sudden now these guys are against me because I'm working with Q to try to get tech released so we can go out and do our own thing. All the old folks, Don Juan, Diamond, all your, so, you know, Midwest side people, caught feelings about this shit. They're like, fuck tech. Fortunately for Tech 9 and Travis, things finally started falling into place. In 2000, Tech 9 was cleared of all his contractual obligations. And then we, we put a record together, which was Angelic. While in Los Angeles shopping Angelic, Tech 9 and Travis gave a copy of the album to Violet Brown, then Urban Music Buyer for Warehouse Music. Travis and Tech then went to the movies. After the movie, Travis checked his voicemail. He had several messages from Violet Brown. I call Violet back, and when I called her back, you know, at that point, this, she's had the CD playing, I guess, for like three or four straight hours, and she's really excited. This is a woman that's been in the source, Power 30, many times, as one of the most powerful people in the record industry, in the rap, and the urban music industry. When she got it, it's just more validation for the way I felt. Violet Brown gave a copy of Angelic to Dave Weiner. The former Priority Records executive was running the urban music department at the fledgling J-Core Records, which was distributed by Interscope Records. Violet Brown gave me a call and said, uh, you have 24 hours to listen to this, uh, this demo. I flipped out. I almost didn't, 
you know, know what to do when I first heard it. Excited about Tech 9 Dave Weiner called Travis. When Dave Weiner first called me and started explaining to me, A, that he, that he understood where we were coming from with the record, and B, his past, how could you not be sold? I mean, priority records. You're looking at NWA, Ice Cube. He brought in Master P. We want to have that same success. We want the Ice Cube success, the NWA success, the Master P success. J Core and Strange Music came to an agreement on Tech Nine. Tech Nine, Travis, and Dave flew to J Core's New York office to sign the deal. They were willing to do a 50 50 joint venture deal with Strange Music on the Tech Nine records. So um, we ended up signing up. Tech Nine's first release on J Core was Angelic. Angelic, good and bad, angel and hell. That's where I got the title from. You've got heaven, hell, and purgatory. You've got three different categories. And he wanted to start it off in hell, go into purgatory, and then end up in heaven. I thought Angelic was, uh, was probably the most unique concept that I'd ever heard of. It was my life story. You know what I'm saying? I wrote, it was like the past five years of my life. He's talking about all the things that were in his life at that time that were tormenting him. You know, women, liquor, money, hella drugs. The dark parts of it really reached into his soul and really showed some of the deepest, darkest things that Tech 9 was having to deal with in his life. And it, it, he, he felt his pain. Tech 9 is one of the artists that doesn't mind sharing his true feelings with his listener. Tech's wife always says people party to her pain because around that time they were in a lot of shit. Tech's pain was best depicted on this ring. It's what his, his story about trying to balance wife, kids, relationship, the things that, he, that are so important to him, and then balancing the other things which are fame and notoriety, women, groupies, whatever. But your wife, instead of yelling about quality time, and you think with all the fame and fortune shit ought to be fine. But what happens when the divorce papers just got to be signed and you lose half and your children because you got to be nine. It takes a lot for, for somebody just to leave their home and just be on a roll like that. By sharing his most intimate struggles, Tech 9 opened himself up to the world. I think he got a lot of loyal followers from that because they, they could tell like he was coming from a totally unique space. Uh, he wasn't trying to copy nobody. He was just kind of like venting on the mic. Tech Nine is not scared to tackle some of those subjects that might be taboo to uh, a lesser strength artist or human being, for that matter. And a lot of people, they love to hear pain. You know what I'm saying? That's why people, a lot of people like Pac. You know what I'm saying? Because he gave all his pain. My fans dig that I'll tell the real. And that's why they love me. Now that he was finished with his portion of Angelic, Tech Nine submitted the album to J Core Records. The company contacted Tech's beat makers, including longtime collaborator Don Juan, to finalize production of the album. And when it came time for Don Juan to, to final mix and turn in his files, it was all about paper. It was all about him getting paid. You already got paid! With Don Juan holding out, Travis could not deliver Angelic to J-Core. I'm missing deadlines trying to put the record together. You're holding me up. All of a sudden, Don Juan's lawyers try to go into the people that we did the JV with and get paid behind our backs. They call me like, who in the fuck is this and why is he coming to us for money? I'm like, ain't this a bitch? In order to get the master, Travis and friends make a late night visit to Don Juan. They go to Don Juan's like at midnight and they're like, boom, boom, boom. They need the masters, man. So Travis goes in Don Juan's by himself. This is taking 12, one o'clock in the morning, man. Don Juan's will sleep. His wife opens the door. Trav comes out with the Masters. Now with the Masters, j Core is ready to release Angelic. Everybody was buzzing. It was, it was a beautiful thing, man. You know what I mean? I'll never forget that time. We started getting national coverage. We were doing shit for the source. We were doing shit for Double XL. We had write-ups in Murder Dog. We had write-ups in other national publications that we had never gotten before. It was really fire. I mean, it was the best way to explain it. It's just this, this buzz and this heat everywhere. We did billboards, Tech 9, Angelic, all throughout Kansas City. I was totally gassed to see billboards in my hometown for the first time. We were the first people in Kansas City, Missouri 
to ever rap bands with Tech 9 Angelic. It made the shit seem larger than life. We're doing concerts everywhere on Angelic. You know what I mean? It was big. It was big. And now that all that was established, I felt like this is about to be it for me. Angelic is about to take me up out of here. Like, With Kansas City behind him, Tech 9s team was surprised by j first week sales estimate for Angelic. They said, you know, we think you're going to do about 7,500. And I'm like, fuck, this isn't why I teamed up with you guys. I felt like I could have done that shit by myself. But first week sales of Angelic blew away j founder Jay Ferris' expectations. We got a call from one of Jay Ferris' flunkies. I forgot his name, Dan or whatever his name was. I really don't know. You won't believe it, Tech. 23,000 copies the first three days. I think we got a winner here. We billboard charted. Fucking, it was fucking mayhem, you know, on our in stores and shit like that. It was crazy. But Tech Nine's success came with its own set of problems. Tech's early supporters began questioning his increasingly extreme image. The spiked red hair and the, and the paint in his face, you know, niggas from the hood was like, whoa, hold on, man. Tech is losing it, man. Oh, people would ask me, like, what's up with that cat with the shit on his face? You know what I'm saying? And I used to seeing a black dude with red hair and a long beard. I mean, he look, he looked scary to me, too. You had some people saying, man, that nigga Tech, man, he's selling out, man. That's, that's, he's doing that shit for the white folks. That's white shit he doing, man. Instead of looking at that CD for what it was, everyone assumed that Tech was a devil worshiper because you just see that image with Tech 9 and the horns and the fire behind him and the angels. I'm like, okay, how ridiculous is that? You know, it, it worked for other people like Missy and, and, and Eminem and Busta Rhymes. They all dress up crazy and do crazy things, but nobody looks at them crazy for doing it. I used to paint uh, a cross on my fore on my on my face. You know, back in the day, I used to paint my whole face and then have a black cross. It wasn't an upside down cross. It was a cross. I was still a devil worshiper because I was a black dude with his face painted, so that's got to be evil. Never have I ever uh, worshipped a devil, whatever that is, you know what I mean, or, or, or Satan. He's not no devil worshiper, man. So Y'all stop hating on my boy like that, man, trying to, you know, twist him up, you know. Don't get him misunderstood. My hair is truly how I feel my brain is, like, you know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> I got so much shit in there, dude. But the problems didn't stop Tech 9s momentum. Because of Angelic's strong sales, j agreed to do a video for the single, It's Alive. Let's do the video! So they write the treatment to a $100,000 video. We're the Lost Boys hanging by, you know, upside down. It was It's Alive. It was me big. Three or four days before we come to L.A. to shoot our video, they start talking about, well, we, we need to do a more economical video. It's going to be a really bland version of what we had in mind, but it's a video. So everyone was in town. And, and, and Violet had lined up, Busta Rhymes and... Cottonmouth Kings said they'd jump in it. I think Cypress Hill said they would jump in it. All for free. All these people's doing cameos for free. And we're just geeked. D12s, most of them dudes said they'd be in it. The production company that's doing the video is waiting on their advance of half the money to, to shoot the video. We did smoke out. We're sitting in our hotels the next day, ready to shoot the video. They're like postponing the video. We're waiting another day. No deposit. I'm like, what's going on here? I call the next day. Man, I remember that phone call. We were in the hotel room. And I say, Dan, I don't know what's going on, bro, but they're sitting here. The shit's getting all fucked up. The schedule with the video's getting all fucked up because you guys aren't wiring the money. What's going on? They're like, you can't shoot the video. It's off. He's like, why? They're like, because Eight Ball needs the money to shoot his video with Puffy. So Trav starts flipping the fuck out, like uh, saying, you know, ba 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 ba. Man, <laughs> tears start coming in his eyes. He's getting mad as a motherfucker. Trav shut his phone. He looks at me and said, I don't know how to tell Tech this. <laughs> Travis had to tell me that they pulled out. That was like the final like knife in the back. That was the final straw. I said, Dan, it's done. I drove straight to Kansas City, grabbed a few of my gorillas, whatever you want to call them and drove my punk ass straight to fucking New York to get out of the deal. We ended up working out something with the president of j -Corps to get back the master for Angelic and to be a free agent to move forward and record it. Even though he regained the rights to Angelic, Tech 9 was devastated. 
by the way Jay Core handled his album. That happening to Angelic, that hurt. You know what I mean? Because I didn't know what I was gonna do after that. That hurt. I'm like, what the fuck? When J. Core fell like that, I didn't blame it on Dave Weiner for taking us there. Because Dave Weiner got the fuck up out of there too. Dave is telling me that he's going back and he's hooking up with his mentor. He's hooking up with the guy who started Priority Records. Dave just say, my mentor, um, Mark Ceramic's thinking about getting back in the business, man. They're going to, to put together uh, a, a major, you know, a, an independent label to start with the ambition and ideas of building the success of another Priority Records. And this venture is called MSC Music and Entertainment. Mark had taken some time off from the record industry and uh, when he wanted to get back in, uh, you know, he called me up. It was, it couldn't have been better timing because we had just left, we'd just gotten released from Interscope. And he called up asking if we had, or if I had any uh, talent that I was excited about. And you know, from, I think that was it. From there forward, I, you know, I freaked out and told him, yeah, couldn't, you know, things normally don't fall into place when they're supposed to. It seemed like Tech 9 finally caught a break. The reason that we felt like MSC was a perfect fit because A, we could get the deal that we needed to get, which was a 50-50 joint venture type scenario, some type of deal. We also felt like, how can you argue with the history of Priority Records, with NWA, with Ice Cube, with Master P, with all of those things, and Mark Cerami uh, being a legend in the business. Mark Cerami being a cat that's a little bit to the left, just like Dave Weiner, just like Travis O'Gwen, just like myself. Perfect combination. It was time to get into the studio and get some things off of Tech's head and go in there and create a new masterpiece, a new album, one that we felt uh, would be as strong as Angelic. Tech Nine funneled all of his emotions into his next album, Absolute Power. Absolute Power was kind of looked at upon us as kind of like the, the fuck you album. That's why it starts off with industry as punks. I heard, dun, 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 dun. Industry is punks, dude. I'm talking about, I heard that shit. It sounded like Godzilla was coming to get you. Tech also wanted to give his fans absolute access with a special absolute power bonus DVD. I want to give them a visual so they can be more, so they can get more familiar with me as a person. Because when you open up like that, a lot more people want to know. People are the nosiest motherfuckers. You know what I mean? That's why Court TV is big. If you've ever seen Tech 9 live, it's some different shit. So we wanted to share that with the fans. So all the fans that didn't know of Tech or we didn't have the ability to put them on the road, fuck that. We'll bring him to you. And you get seven extra songs on that DVD? <clears throat> we was giving away shit like Madman. We almost be crazy to give this away. Despite the good news, Tech 9 had to face some long brewing drama back in Kansas City. When we tried to put out absolute power, Diamond said he felt like he didn't make all his money when he was fucking with me, you know, so, which is fucked up for real. Then it got real bad, you know what I'm saying? I started hearing shit like, I'm gonna kill that nigga, he owes me money. I'm like hearing it from stripper bitches and shit. I'm like, damn, what's, what's, what, am, what am I doing wrong? Nigga, I ain't making no money, you know what I'm saying? I'm out here hustling, just making enough to get by with my family. And it's hard because they on the block and they seeing this shit on TV and they seeing billboards and they hearing my shit on the radio everywhere they go. They're like, this nigga's, you know, making money. To end the beef, Tech 9 and Travis agreed to let Diamond release a Tech 9 album. I said, fuck it. Okay, put your shit out. Travis was like, okay, fuck it, put your shit out. We got an album coming out called Absolute Power. Don't try to do it, Diamond. Put it out on the same day. He said he was gonna put it out months and months ahead. But Diamond's album arrived in stores just days before Absolute Power. Celsius, all blue album, you know what I'm saying? Me, car, Porsche on the front of it, you know what I'm saying? Diamonds and shit, my name in diamonds, totally not Tech 9 you know what I'm saying? For me to be getting all that drama right now when I'm, when I'm still striving to be the star that I fucking am, to be getting that bullshit, that, that, that caliber of bullshit, it really fucks me up. Despite the drama, Absolute Power's first single had a lighthearted feel. The song was Slacker. I'm a slacker. Never been a hell of a lot of dough. I'm a slacker. Smoking pot and watching video. I'm a slacker. Do whichever way to win those. That was another song that really just, you know, kind of hit you in the heart. You know, you just felt like a bum sitting around playing video games, drinking, doing whatever. 
you know, it was something that you could really feel. With momentum on his side, Tech 9 went to Los Angeles to shoot the first video of his career. And then they were gonna shoot Slacker, and they flew me out there for that. I was like, yeah, this shit's gonna work. It's gonna pop. I'm a product of Reaganomics, neurotic, they say, and I'm it just got up inhaling chronic. The artist, I'm staying honest, I'm about to make it famous. True. So you can take the JOB and you can shove it up your. True. I ain't never understood how the world works, but I always understood why the girls twerk for a baller, not a nine. Of Absolute really power really had the streets of Kansas City on fire. We had a. Uh... I think it was three or 4,000 people that showed up to a record store in Kansas City, Missouri. And we weren't able to really get tech to the store. It was too crowded, the intersections were shut down, the fire department was there. And we ended up having to fly them in in a, in a helicopter to get them uh, into the store. Indeed, absolute power was gearing up to be the absolute test for Tech 9. The hopes were like crazy, like, you gotta do it. The whole city's pointing their finger on you, like, yo, you don't do it, you, it's, it's fuck you. You gotta tuck away under a rock. The fuck you attitude was brewing hella big. It was building on Tech, all the pressure was, because, man, I'm telling you, it became 30, 40 people just depending on him. To add to the pressure, Slacker was not a runaway hit at radio or video. Our radio campaign on the first single, Slacker, didn't work as well as we would have liked. Me doing a video for that, and the motherfucker's not playing it. <laughs> it was kind of a letdown, because we did a beautiful video. We had a choice to either do another video or do commercials on TV saying, fuck the industry. I was like, that's perfect for me. I'm Mr. Fuck You Man, why not? Let me be the poster child for Fuck the Industry. It was a 30 second commercial of Tech 9 saying, Download my new album, Absolute Power, for free. Knowledge is power, baby. Absolute Power. Tech 9? It was at the same point when the RAAA was doing their campaign with Britney Spears and, and Sheryl Crow uh, asking fans to not download their music. I was the first artist to tell people to go fucking download my shit after it was out. You know what I'm saying? That's almost like shooting yourself in the head. The FTI campaign is dope to me because I feel the same way in a sense. FTI, I, I didn't necessarily think it was a good idea. Tech 9 knew the FTI campaign was a monumental risk. One or two things are gonna happen. They're gonna download it and they're gonna buy it or they're gonna download it and they're not gonna buy it. We ended up tripling our sales um, over a period of six weeks. They spiked over 300%. Good music sells. And it keep getting better and better, and it's, the sales keep going up. It felt beautiful that I had the balls to do that. He took a chance, he gambled, and he won with it. The success of the FTI campaign helped Tech get more shows, where his absolute power is on full display. When this ring comes on, it looks like a Coca-Cola commercial. I like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. It's so significant, dude. There's something about Tech. He's born to perform. He comes out, dance steps. They got routines. Him and his hype man, they together. He got uh, outfit changes. He got females coming on stage, taking shit off, putting shit on. He He's not just your regular motherfucker walking back and on fourth on stage grabbing his nuts. I've seen him come in in biohazard suits. He come out with shit paint on his head and it could be killed, king. You don't know what the fuck gonna be on his head. Uh, what type of makeup he wearing, you feel me? Or type of spike shit he gonna have going down. But it's exciting and it's original. And I've never seen anybody do a show like Tech does shows. I mean, he's not just cold in the booth, man. He's hard on the stage, man. Him, Calico, Cut, when they do their thing on the stage, man, they, they, he's sick on the stage. I think we got probably one of the most energetic shows. I'm 340 pounds, and I can, I dang near do cartwheels on the stage. Wind control, you know what I mean? And be able to spit your shit and run across the stage all that time doing dances and shit, and to hold it down without missing a beat. That's hot to me. Like sometimes we have to do these tours with people who have a bigger name than us, but their show's not as hype. So they end up telling us to go on first, and then the crowd seems to be kind of let down after we get off. In 2003, we did 96 shows. And you can't do 96 shows in a year without no fans, you know what I mean? Somebody loving them out there. Those 96 shows included a transcontinental journey. 
Van Tech Nine, Corrupt, Numb Skull, Drew Down, his whole clique. We was in uh, Australia. And we took toward the biggest cities, what, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, a couple more cities, and we went to uh, New Zealand. We were walking through the streets of New Zealand, and motherfuckers was like, go back to America, get out of here, until we got, and then we got on stage, and then everybody's like, instantly on our jock. Fans across the globe noticed the impact Strange Music was making. Strange Music and Tech was making a lot of noise. Tech Nine, even even pushing the line, you know, on the independent tip, and he got a strong following. I still think he could be as big as Pac as long as people come into his world. After years of false starts and bad contracts, Tech Nine refused to quit. He's certainly gone through his share of hell. No matter how bad it got, or or how bad, bad the deals were, or how many people were signed to, his creative juices never stopped. So Tech just kept going and going and going and just got better. Some of the people here feel like he's not as grounded as he used to be. But, I mean, shit, he shouldn't be the same cat he was eight years ago. As Tech 9 grew as a person, both his experiences and his music evolved. Tech's lived an alternative life and a street life. It's not a lot of people that's lived both lives. Tech combines it. You really have to know Tech to know that what he's doing now is what, that's really Tech 9. Tech 9 really exemplifies what hip hop is all about. It's about being new, it's about being diverse, it's about being passionate, uh, passionate, and it's about being truthful to who you are and what you do. By sticking to his artistic vision, Tech 9 is taking hip hop to the next level. Today he's still, of course, years ahead of, of where hip hop is and where rap is. Tech is that next style, that next level, that new shit that's gonna take hip hop to the next level. His shit is like tomorrow's music. I've worked with, uh, you know, everyone that was ever signed to Priority Records from Ice Cube to Easy e to Master P. And um, uh, as incredible as they all are, and, and I'm a huge fan of, of the three I just named, uh, you know, Tech 9 to me is he's in his own league. Tech is bound to make it big as Jay Z. I hope he be uh, just as big as uh, Eminem and uh, 50 Cent and all the rest of them because I think he's just as uh, talented. And this nigga is the tightest nigga moving, man. I mean, Eminem hot. Yeah, I give it up to him. Jay-Z, mega hot. I give it up to him. Nah, it's hot. But none of them niggas can fuck with Tech 9 And I put that on anything, nigga. I put a million on that, nigga. Yeah, put up some money, nigga. Rockefeller, whoever, nigga. Tech 9 would demolish all you niggas from the stage show to rocking the mic, you name it. By making a name for himself, Tech 9 put his city on the rap map. He has done here what most people can only dream about doing. What Master P did for New Orleans is kind of like what Tech is doing for us. New Orleans was somewhere that nobody had ever come from in the rap, on the rap scene. And Kansas City is like one of those places. Nobody out there with a major deal is from Kansas City, and that's what Tech, you know, Tech's bought to us. You know, I can tell you hands down that Tech 9 is very much respected and revered and loved in his hometown, which is really hard. Jesus couldn't even do it. The next step for Tech 9 comes with his next album. And after Absolute Power, there will be Ever Ready the Religion. I'm still going. I'm still going. I still got that youngster in me, man. I, I, I can't sit down. I won't lay down for nobody. This is what I was put here to do. Yeah, man, uh, just say your name and uh, what Tech 9 means in Kansas City. My name is Mike Walker. I believe that Tech 9 means to the Kansas City that, um, you know. Uh, let me, let me start. <laughs> it's all good. Nah, you don't have to come back. You can just stay there. <laughs> let me just start, start over. It's all good. Let me see. What do you mean? Just don't think it actually uh, Yeah, I, let me see. I believe Tech 9 is a new start to Kansas City. You know, it's something different. I've really mm -hmm. never seen anything like his style. His style is unique. So. I'm right here doing, doing shit my DVD right here, man. Right here? Yeah. Nah, nah, nah. I don't think. Deuce. Hey, it's Deuce, nigga. That's my nigga from way, way, way back. We go way back. I'm talking about way, way back. You got that tech nine. <laughs> got that Ace Deuce. Ace Deuce. You know what I'm saying? It's my nigga, nigga been putting it down lyrically for, for sure. years. For sure. You know what I'm saying? Without a doubt. Y'all take nine fans? 
How you spell that? Man, check the door, yo shit, man. You got this motherfucker, dog. Just do your business. Fuck these bitch ass niggas out here hating, man. Cause it's K. C. You dig, nigga? I ain't one sexy, man. I ain't one sexy, man. We gon' fuck these niggas. Can't see your bar.